So thank you for coming, everybody. I got interested in early Christian art back when I was in seminary. Um, I just happened to uh, do an essay, uh, a Christian history essay, and because I was a TV guy, having been a documentary filmmaker, I want. I wondered. I wonder what early Christian art looks like, because we all know what older Christian art looks like. Um, but I wonder what the earliest Christian art looked like. And I started looking into it, and I was just fascinated, because um, <clears throat> the thing about art is, particularly for if you want to portray, portray someone like Jesus, um, by the time they start making Christian art, which is in the late second century, so the late 100s, um, nobody knows what uh, Jesus looked like, right? Like they didn't write it down. Nobody remembers. Nobody's alive who remembered. Um, so every portrayal of Jesus is not just a portrayal of what they think the man looked like, but also a portrayal of what he meant, right? The theological portrayal as well as a guess at what he looked like. And, and that's true for basically all of the Bible stories because nobody knows what Noah looked like or Jonah looked like. Um, and so every depiction is a sort of theology put into pictures. And what I found in those pictures was a very different kind of theology than the Christianity which followed later. And I found that fascinating. So I uh, wanted to understand more about this. So I spent, you know, off and on years reading books and looking at pictures and stuff. But, you know, what would be really cool would be actually to see the stuff in person. So when it came time for my sabbatical this past summer, I knew I knew immediately what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to Rome and I wanted to take time to do it so I could just geek out completely for a long time. And I didn't ask my wife to come with me because I knew that that would be really boring for her. <laughs> <laughs> so I went solo. <clears throat> I spent three weeks in Rome just going to every example of early Christian art I could find because it's all in Rome. Um, the uh, very first Christian uh, paintings and carvings uh, appear in Rome, and the Vatican very conveniently has collected a whole lot of them and put them into the Vatican Museum. So we'll see, we'll be seeing pictures from the Vatican Museums today. And um, the other place where Christian art, well, the beginning of Christian art by Christians <clears throat> is first seen in the catacombs. And so I visited uh, four or five catacombs. And the catacombs are underground burial crypts, and I'll be showing you pictures of both the art as well as what the catacombs themselves look like. But I thought I would start by just showing you a typical picture from a catacomb, and just to sort of whet your appetite for this. So this is a picture um, that's found in uh, the Priscilla catacomb, named after the woman who owned the catacomb. And this is um, a married woman. And we know that she's married because she's wearing a veil over her head. That's not long white hair. That's a veil. So this means that she's married. And this was painted on a wall in, in, in the room that contained her tomb. And you can see there's a bunch of things going on here. First of all, you can see that her hands are up, right, on, on either side of her. Um, this is called the Oran's position, O-R-A-N-S. And this is how everybody prayed back then. Jews, pagans, Christians, everybody prayed standing up with their hands out like that. And you may recognize this pose because it's the pose that ministers um, uh, adopt when we give the benediction at the end of a service or when we're blessing the elements during communion. So... Every time you see a minister with their hands out, they're actually carrying on an ancient practice of what it looks like to be praying. You have to be standing up and your hands have to be out. But what's interesting about this picture, in addition, is that it's in her tomb. And this is what the rest of the picture looks like. So on either side, we see two scenes from her life. On the left-hand side, we see the day that she got married. I'm sorry, it's a little blurry in this picture, but she's the figure in the middle holding her marriage certificate. Her husband is on the right-hand side and presumably the officiant is on the left. So, you know, this is a big deal in her life. Uh, she got married. And then on the other side of her, there's a picture of her holding her first child. So you see a naked infant. Oh, right. So... The whole picture is presenting 
a, a sketch of her entire life. And what's interesting is that the middle image is not supposed to represent her as she was when she was alive, but as she is now that she's in heaven. She's praying in heaven and she's looking outward. And later on in this presentation, I'll show you what she's looking outward at in her catacomb, in her section of the catacomb. So these, uh, one of the things which is interesting about um, the uh, catacomb art is that you see a lot of women uh, in a way that you won't see in churches later on. You know, I, I, spent, uh, I spent the summer in Europe um, I was in Rome for three weeks and then I went down to France and then I spent a couple of weeks uh, walking around Spain doing part of the Camino. And I went to churches in every town I, I visited. Like I, I figured this is my summer to geek out on Christian art. So I went to every single church that was in every little small town in Spain that I came across as well as some of the big towns. And the fact of the matter is the only women in those churches who were depicted in their art are the Virgin Mary, Virgin slash Mother Mary, and a few saints, and that's it. You never see normal women again. But it's important to know that when Christian art begins, normal women are depicted. They, they are in the images um, as the people who have died and sometimes as guides, as we'll see later on. Um, so it wasn't necessary that uh, Christian art become all men all the time, with the exception of Mary. It actually started out with women on the walls, and that was something that was lost. So uh, why were people in catacombs at all? You know, why weren't they just buried in regular uh, graveyards? Well, a few reasons. Um, Christians believed, you know, Christians were followers of Christ. And Christ was killed on the cross. And then three days later, he was resurrected in bodily form, right? He didn't come back as a ghost. He came back as a human being in the same body that he left in because he had holes in his hands and holes in his feet. And so Christians believed that they were being offered eternal life. But it was an eternal life where their soul would be rejoined with their body at the end of time. Um, you know, the final judgment would happen their bodies would rise out of the graves uh, and they would be judged soul and body together. And so they wanted to be buried whole. They didn't want to be cremated. They wanted to be buried whole. And that was a departure from what their neighbors were doing. Back in the first and second centuries in Rome, as well as in the rest of the Roman empire, the pagans were cremated. That was just normal. And so their cemeteries didn't have bodies that were laid out in the ground. They had, um, they had their ashes. So, and we know what their cemeteries or what their graveyards looked like um, because uh, in Rome, they keep coming across them. And I went to visit one of them in the Vatican where the Vatican uh, a number of years ago was trying to dig another underground parking garage because even the Vatican needs parking. And um, when they did the dig, they came across a Roman necropolis. And the Romans named their graveyard necropolis because necropolis means city of the dead. Um, the pagans didn't believe that you got much of an afterlife, right? You know, you probably heard the stories about, you know, coins on the eyes, you go off, you pay the, you pay the ferryman, you cross the river sticks, and then you just sort of lie down and don't really do anything for the rest of time because you're just a shade. Christians believed in a more active afterlife, um, but the pagans didn't, so they thought it was okay to burn their bodies. And uh, they created these cities of the dead, which is where the dead lived. So this is this is underground, uh, under a uh, under a parking lot in the Vatican. And this is a necropolis. So you can see some tombstones right? Classic looking tombstones, because they use those too. You can also see um, amphorae. Uh, yeah, here, this is a better picture. You see a little bit towards the back there, you see these big pots, uh, or rather, uh, they look like big clay wine bottles sticking out of the ground. Those would have been filled with ashes. Huh? And, and they'd be buried in the ground. Um, and so they would bring their dead, 
to uh, these places where there were incineration furnaces. So they would incinerate the skeletons and then place them into clay vessels. And you can see the lids of a few clay vessels here. We're looking down from a scaffolding here. And sometimes they would, the richer people would uh, create little buildings that would hold the ashes of their families. And this, we're looking down into one of those buildings here. So imagine that there used to be a roof on this structure, but it's gone now. And we're looking down and those sort of pizza shaped, uh, pizza oven shaped uh, crevices um, are called arcosoleums. And inside the ashes of the dead would be placed. And you can see that the Romans um, did decorate the walls of these tombs. Um, you can see some snakes on the walls there. And they would often put the portraits of some of their gods, like it wasn't uncommon to show Medusa um, on, on the grave uh, in, within one of these rooms as a sort of protective deity. So... The interesting thing is that the Romans died and burnt, you know, cremated themselves. The Christians, though, because they expected that they would be resurrected, they didn't think of death as final. They thought of it as a sleep. And so when they chose the name for their uh, graveyards, they chose a name that which is based on a Greek word, um, which is called koimos. Um, which meant sem which meant place of sleep. And our word cemetery comes from that Greek word. The word cemetery means sleeping place because Christians believe we're going to go to sleep for a while and then wake up. So a very different proposition from a necropolis. So when the Christians wanted to bury their dead, at first they were forced to just bury their dead in necropoli, like the Romans did, because there was no other choice. But in the second century, um, some rich Christians were encouraged to share their land so that it could be used as a Christian burial places where people could be buried whole. And um, everybody back then was buried outside of the city walls for hygiene reasons. So necropoli a necropolis would be beyond the Roman, the, beyond the wall of the Roman city. And the same thing was true for um, Christian burial places. But rich Christians were encouraged to help the poor at all times, and that included in death. And so in the late second century, some wealthy Christians outside of, outside of Rome donated some land on their country estates where there had been quarries that had been used for just, you know, digging up rock. Um, and those places were adopted as Christian burial places, and they were called catacombs. And there's some... There's some debate about why the word catacomb, uh, it, it's derived from the Latin and it seems to mean near the hollows. So it suggests that it's near the place where there's already holes, like a quarry. Um, so uh, let me show you what some of these look like. So they're outside of Rome. And they were often underneath major roadways. So this is the road outside of the San Calisto uh, catacomb. Um, I took a subway and then an Uber to get there. Um, and the roads, some of these roads still exist and they're on lovely country estates. And on the day that I visited, it was really, really hot. So you can see that's the meeting point. That's That was the entrance to the catacomb, which was underneath. And it was about... The whole time I was in Rome, it was extraordinarily hot. It was like between 35 to 38 degrees most of July. So uh, going to visit the catacombs was the nice thing because they're really cool. Uh, the temperature drops by around 20 degrees. And this is what it looks like. Um, it is very creepy. It just is. It's really creepy. Um, and the hallways truly are this narrow. There are no wide hallways. It's single file all the way. Um, and the slots you see at the side of the walls, that's where the bodies went. This gives you a, a better idea. The slots, um, as you can see, seem too small for bodies. That's because many of them were for children and infants infant mortality rates and child mortality rates were extraordinarily high. So a lot of these were dedicated to children. 
but um and but there are also adult size ones but the adult size ones are smaller than we would expect um one of the visits i did the summers i went to pompeii and in pompeii uh, because the town still exists um, you get a pretty good sense of how tall people were and uh, your average male uh, adult male would be around five feet tall like you know quite short compared to us so they're they're the slots in the walls would be quite small as well this is what it looked like back when they were putting it together um there would be diggers called fossors who would um, dig into the rock and the rock was is a volcanic kind of rock called tough so it's quite soft we scrape it with your fingers and it comes off so it's not like digging into canadian shield granite or anything and the bodies would be put into these slots wrapped in a sheet and then a marble or terracotta tombstone would be placed on the front and we see a couple of examples of these you'll notice that in the hallways that we walk down now there are no marble uh, coverings no marble tombstones on the slots and that's because of uh, tomb raiders and barbarian invasions and i'll talk about that in a little while but uh, now when we go, there's no bodies in the slots and the marble is, is being um, taken away. But uh, fortunately, we know what the marble looked like because even though a lot of it was thrown to the ground and smashed, um, it couldn't all go away. Um, so a lot of it's being collected and it's being, you can find it in the Vatican now. So this is a picture from the Vatican Museum. And it has these just walls and walls of um, these marble um, headstones that used to cover the catacomb uh, slots. They're written in um, Latin. And you can see it's it's obviously handwritten, right? Like, you know, it's not, it's, there's nothing fancy about this. It's, you know, a human being with a hammer and chisel was uh, were the ones who did this. And it's on these marble slabs that we start to see the first hints of Christian iconography. So on this one, you can see a dove and a branch. And so the dove with a branch in its mouth or the branch in its, in its feet is an image which shows up all the time in this early Christian art. And can anybody guess where this image comes from in terms of Bible stories? No. Okay. Noah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, when Noah's in the ark and he wants to know whether there's any land where they can, you know, um, bring the boat, um, he sends out a raven who just disappears and doesn't come back. And then he sends out a dove and the dove come, goes out, comes back once, can't find anything, goes out again, comes back with an olive branch in its, in its, um, in its uh, talons or claws, I guess. And that sign that there must be dry land and that um, the world is coming back to life. And so the Christians chose this image as a way of, of reassuring those who are dying and those who um, are expected to die, that there is life after death. That just as Noah found new life on earth, we will find new life in death. And so they use um, the dove and the branch as an example of that. There's also another uh, Christian image here with the P and the X. So these are uh, Greek letters, which represent um, the first two letters of um, Jesus Christ's name, and it's called a chiro. And you can see it's in a number of places, uh, um, two on the first line and another one on the second line. And this particular gravestone um, says in the first line in Latin, it says, I was protected. Then in the second line where it says in pace, so that's in peace. And the vixit means uh, lived, uh -huh. you know, when did they live? Um, and then anis, that would be the year. So eight years, or sorry, they're nine years rather. Menses is months, so eight months or uh, nine months, and dies is days, so three days. So this is a child's tomb who lived for nine years, nine months, and three days. So they presumably they died on September third. And the final line, Nucratus, means nursed. Um, Deo Christo, God Christ. 
Martyribus. So it's possible that they meant that this person will be nursed or taken care of by God and the martyrs. Another example, here's one which is actually still in the catacombs. Um, again, this is uh, for someone who died young. So the second line says, Vixit lived, and it's, uh, in this case, eight years, uh, Mentibus, three months. So eight years, three months. And the bottom says Filio, so this was a son. But you can see more, um, you see more Christian imagery here. On the right-hand side, a fish. So the fish can represent Christ because uh, the, the uh, term Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, uh, in Greek, if you took the first letters of each one of those, of those words, they spell the word fish. Um, but also, when Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee looking for disciples, the, the King James Version, he says, come, I'll make you fishers of men. So Christ's followers are also considered fish who have been uh, pulled out of the turbulent and danger water, dangerous waters of this life. And on the left-hand side, we see an anchor. So in death, a Christian is uh, finally brought to a safe harbor. Mm. And this one, uh, the name is kind of cracked here, but it means Irene. And this person, again, we see them in the Iran state. So they're, they're praying in heaven and they're being greeted by the Holy Spirit, represented by that dove with the branch in its hands. Mm -hmm. The catacombs were vast, like really huge. This is a map of the Priscilla catacomb. Um, it's just huge. Uh, the One of the catacombs, the San Calisto one, okay. uh, that I showed you the entrance mm -hmm. to before, it's estimated that it had half a million people buried in. And multiple levels, uh, they would go down three or four levels. And the the tombs like the the tunnels went on for miles and miles and miles and you could easily get lost so you needed a guide to bring you through and of course there was no there were no lights down there i mean there were a few shafts of light um which um, had been dug as skylights but otherwise it was just mm -hmm. um so you needed a guide to help you get in and out of there i'm going to stop there for a second and um see if any of you have any questions Oh, yeah. Uh, Martha? Yep. Hi. I just wanted wondered, can you give us a sense of, um, you said they were vast, but I'm wondering um, how many acres or like, it, it looks like an underground city to me. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, I mean, we're talking like dozens of kilometers of tunnels in some wow. catacombs. Yeah. And I'm not sure about the acreage, um, but. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, huge, like really, really. Yeah. And and the re and part of the reason why was that um, you know poor Christians would be you know they first of all Roman society there were a few rich people and a lot of poor people and when Christianity started it was poor people who it attracted right um, Christianity said that people who were enslaved were just as valuable as people. Greek. So it was quite a popular religion among the enslaved, but of course, most of the enslaved didn't have any money. So when they died, they died in poverty. And um, so their bodies would be taken to the catacombs as well as all the other poor Christians. Um, and life was short back then, right? You know, yeah. People yeah. didn't live to their 80s unless you were very wealthy or very lucky genetically. Um, so with high infant mortality rates and just high adult mortality rates, they needed a lot of room um, and they, so they just kept digging and digging and digging. And as I said, the stone here is quite soft, so it wasn't hard to extend a tunnel. I mean, you know, still took money and effort, but um, uh, they just kept making them bigger and bigger and bigger. I find Stephen, it, oh. sorry, I, I, I find it amazing to think that all of that, it was the Romans um, who did this? I've always sort of felt, you know, the Romans bad people. 
<laughs> well, it, well, it wasn't the Roman pagans who did this. It was Roman Christian. Christians. Yeah, no, it's just amazing. Yeah. Um, Jocelyn, I think you had a question. So you seem to say that they were surprised when they dug for the underground parking lot to come across the catacombs. And yet there's this huge expanse of catacombs that you've shown us out all, you know, no grid system or anything. So what's on top of that now? And what do they, how did they know they were down there if they didn't know? Well, um, the necropolis, which they found under the Vatican is not a catacomb. It's a, oh. it's a Roman burial ground, right? So, um, and so it doesn't have to be vast because they didn't need to reserve, you know, five feet for every body right which is what happens with the catacomb um with uh the necropolises because everybody was burnt um, uh, there's big, big wine bottles were big and were good enough for storing the ashes the, when i when we were talking to the guide about this at the vatican necropolis she said oh this happens all the time in rome every time you want to dig a subway or a new building foundation poof, we find something ancient slows everything down it takes forever to get anything built here <laughs> so they weren't totally surprised but they didn't know what they were going to find and this time they found a necropolis and so therefore they're not allowed to build on top of it or had there been building on a on the surface layer uh no they chose not to build on top of it and it's tricky right because those bottles still have ashes in them whereas the catacombs the bodies are long gone so mm -hmm. theoretically you could you know build on top of a catacomb or even dig into one but you know for historical reasons the vatican discourages it and um and there's like the it's the Priscilla catacomb there's a convent um uh, next to it and often monasteries would be built right next to the catacomb so that they could be maintained and the monks would be expected to maintain the catacombs mm -hmm. so, thanks yes. any other questions before we go on oh okay so um so now i want to show you the rest of the room uh where we saw that woman at the beginning so so uh one thing i should say before we get to her um is that although the poor were just sort of you know put into slots along the hallways uh, richer families richer christian families could afford bigger spaces and so they were able to dig rooms which were bigger like this one and they too used the sort of pizza oven shape for putting their bodies into and this is the room where the lady who we met at the beginning uh, was buried. And I was in this room, uh, standing at the doorway, pretty much looking in just like this. And what I'd like to do is just slowly walk you through what all of the images on, this, on the ceiling and on the walls here mean. Because it's interesting because they're all significant. So as we've said, she's at the back. She's a married woman who has died. She's depicted in the middle, standing, praying in the afterlife. She is looking outwards, like towards the door. But to look towards the door, she has to look past the ceiling and the images on the ceiling. So what does she see? So here I've just flipped the image. Sorry, it's a little confusing. But so she's on the left looking across. And what she sees first is this image of a shepherd with a ram on his shoulders and a couple of sheep beside him and birds in trees next to him. Any guesses who this might represent? Jesus the shepherd. Jesus, Jesus. Yeah, the good shepherd, Jesus the good shepherd, straight out of the Gospel of John. Yeah, that's right. So Jesus and the early stages, like the late 100s, early 200s, doesn't get depicted as Jesus of Nazareth very often. Instead, he's usually depicted as the good shepherd. So from the beginning, when they start uh, depicting Christian stories um, on the walls, they're steeped in metaphor and symbol as much as any sort of desire for realism. And that's important to consider. You know, we live in a time where... Uh, there's a sect of Christians who say that unless you take things literally, you're not understanding the Bible. Well, you know what? The very first Christians weren't interested in literalism. 
they were interested in the meaning of things. And so when they had a chance to paint Christian images on walls in their own private sanctums where they were being entombed, they chose to represent Jesus metaphorically, not literally. So Jesus is here. He's dressed like a Roman uh, shepherd would be. They're not trying to make him look like a Jew. He doesn't have a beard. He doesn't have long hair. All of that sort of imagery happens later. Um, but he's surrounded by birds. Um, and you can see below him and in on top of him in this view. Peacocks. Uh, they're, they're peacocks, yeah. And peacocks among the pagans, as well as the Christians, are symbols of immortality. And uh, the reason they have that symbolism, it's not just because they're beautiful, but because it was believed back then that their flesh, when they died, took a very long time to decay, if it decayed at all. So there's this idea that they were kind of immortal. So um, they were there. And then on either side, on the right and left, there are partridges. And partridges also show up um, in uh, pagan art. And I, I believe the guide said that they are symbols of loyalty and steadfastness. So our woman, the first thing she sees when she looks out, is she sees the good shepherd who will lead her soul into the afterlife. Okay, like the sheep here are not obviously literal sheep, but uh, Christian souls who need to be protected and led to the right place. And we know that they believe that there's some sort of possible peril because on the side wall, see if you look on the uh, right hand side, you see these three gentlemen with red at their feet. There they are. Um, um, these, these guys are also from a biblical story. Does anyone know which story this is from? We don't talk about this one very much. Although my kids assure me that it was really popular in Veggie Tales. If that helps them. Uh, so these are the three men in the furnace. Um, in the book of Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel is written um, describing the events of what happened after the Jews were taken to Babylon after the fall of the, after the fall of um, the, after the siege of the of Jerusalem and the temple is destroyed and the Babylonians take the royal family and a bunch of other Jews to Babylon in what is now, Babylon's a little bit south of Baghdad in current Iraq. Um, so the Jews are held captive. And in the book of Daniel, it describes some of the adventures of these expatriate Jews who have been taken as prisoners of war. And they're treated well. And some of them are given an education in all things Babylonian, some of the young men. Daniel was one of them, but so are these three guys. And um, the Jews in this story remain loyal to the one God and refuse to worship the Babylonian gods. And they also don't want to worship the Babylonian Empire emperor, even though they will work for him, they won't worship him. So these three Jews get into trouble when they say, no, we're not going to sacrifice to your gods. We only sacrifice to our God. And so the emperor gets enraged and he says, fine, I'm going to make an example of you. And he throws them into the furnace. So he throws them into the furnace and the fire at their feet in this picture is the fire from the furnace. But what happens in the story is the three mm -hmm. men pray to God not to be rescued, not to be rescued, but they praise God. So once again, you see them standing in that Oran's position, right? They are praying to God, not for rescue, but in praise of God for all the great things which God has done. And there's a lovely song that they sing where they encourage every every living being, uh, the stars, animals, the seas, everything to praise God. So they're quite selfless in the furnace and they are not burnt. They're able to walk around in the furnace without being burnt. So there's kind of some parallels to Daniel in the lion's den, right? Cause he's not eaten by the lions either. And the Babylonians are looking into the furnace and just amazed at the fact that these men aren't being burnt. And um, they see a fourth man in the fire. And in the context of the story, it sounds like the fourth man in the fire is probably the angel of God protecting them. But in this image, if you look above the middle man, you'll see the bird with the um, olive. Yes. Right. 
So that is um, the symbol that they've chosen to use for the Holy Spirit rescuing these men. So why would they put this story into a woman's tomb? Well, because, of course, Christ says that, you know, for those who don't follow the Christian way, there is the danger of an afterlife, which will be full, filled with fire and gnashing of teeth and distress and pain, right? So by putting this image into her tomb, she's saying, I know that the Holy Spirit will rescue me from the dangers of death, just as the Holy Spirit rescued the three men in the fire. Okay. And then, <clears throat> and then going back to the image, so, so she's looking across, she sees the good shepherd who will guide her to the safe place. She will avoid the fires of hell, thanks to the good shepherd. Mm -hmm. And if you look all the way to the right of this image, there is this funny image, which is upside down here, but this is what it looks like. There's this image. And this is the penultimate. No. This is the last thing she sees as she looks across. So any guesses what this image represents? It's Something a tongue, I admit. It's a lion? Tongue. It's not a lion. It looks like a snake and a cat. Snake? It does look like a snake. Yeah, it's got a snake yeah. in the tail. Yeah. Here's the weird thing. It is actually uh, the sea creature who swallowed uh, Jonah. Oh, my. There's yeah. Jonah at the right side. That's Jonah coming out of the sea creature's mouth. And um, this is the way they depicted the Jonah story in their art. You can see there's no whale in it, right? Um, instead, you've got this sea monster with the long curly tail. And... That's, I believe that's because the, uh, back then in the first and second and third centuries, most of the Jews who, or rather most of the Christians who read the Hebrew scriptures, read them in Greek. And um, in Greek, uh, the word that we um, translate as whale from the Hebrew, they translated as a word which really meant sea, sea monster. And so they depicted sea monsters being the thing which um, Jonah spent three days and three nights inside of um, before being barfed out onto the shore of Nineveh. And the reason this is on the walls in the catacombs, and there's lots and lots of images of Jonah in the catacombs, is because of something that Christ said in the Bible. He said here in Matthew 12, he said, then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Jesus answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So the Christians under, knew this story was important to Jesus, that he was comparing, sorry, he was comparing his, uh, his time in the earth for those three days between his death and resurrection as uh, comparable to what happened to Jonah, who was in the sea monster for three days and three nights before he was barfed out on the shore. So they decided to use an image of Jonah being expelled from the sea monster as an image of resurrection. And um, as Northrop Fry has pointed out in some of his writings for the ancient Christians, um, anything to do with the sea was a metaphor for uh, chaos as well as death. So to be expelled from a sea monster's mouth meant to be expelled from the world of death into a new life. Okay. Um, and what's interesting, though, and this gets us back to our what I said earlier about these early Christians being more metaphorical than literal, is that there's another image which appears often in the catacombs, which is also from the Jonah story, and it's this one. This is Jonah underneath the bower at near the end of the story. And it's used as an image of what uh, eternal life will be like where Jonah in the story had been really, really hot in the blazing sun, and 
he felt like he was going to die and God miraculously creates a bower that grows around him and you know, over the course of the night so that he can sit and rest in the shade. And so this becomes an image of what um, a resurrected life will look like where one can just be at ease and a life of pleasure and um, not hedonistic pleasure, but a life which is enjoyable as the afterlife. But here's the thing. And it's really funny. If you read the story of Jonah, Jonah is a lousy prophet. He is a lousy role model. You know, God says, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell those people if they don't change their ways, I'm going to destroy them. The Ninevites lived in the city of Nineveh. The city of Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. The same Assyrian Empire, which had conquered and um, expelled the Jews from northern Israel. So they were like a hated enemy of the Jews. The Jews hated the Assyrians. So Jonah says, I don't want to do that. So he hops on a boat and he heads in the different direction. And God catches up with him, right? And sends the storm, the storm to surround the boat. <clears throat> And the pagan soldiers on the boat go, whoa, whose God is mad at us? We're all going to die. And they wake up Jonah and they say, something's wrong. There's this huge storm. We're all going to die. And Jonah goes, oh, wait a second. I think I know what's going on. God is caught up with me. Uh, I think you're going to have to throw me into the water for this storm to end. So that's what they do. They throw him over the edge, over the, over the side. And miraculously, a sea monster or a whale swallows him stays alive for three days in the belly of the beast. He's barfed out at Nineveh. But here's the thing. When he gets to Nineveh, he's no less bitter. He's just as upset as he was before. And he traipses into town and he half-heartedly says, if you don't change your ways, God's going to destroy you. Okay, done. And he goes to sit on a hill and he's kind of hoping to see fire and brimstone destroy Nineveh because he hates the Ninevites. But instead... The Ninevite king hears about this uh, dire warning and he tells all of his people to put on sackcloth and dump ashes on their heads because that's how you mourn and that's how you repent back then. And they all do it. Even the animals are instructed to do it. So God changes God's mind. And Jonah is so peeved by this. He says, "Ugh, I knew you might do this. You're the forgiving God. Ugh." Just kill me now. It's hot. I'm uncomfortable. Just kill me now. And so God grows this bower above Jonah, and it's really nice. But Jonah keeps complaining about the fact that the Ninevites aren't going to be destroyed. So to teach Jonah a lesson, overnight God sends a worm which kills the bower. So Jonah wakes up in underneath a withered bower which provides no shade. And Jonah starts complaining all over again. And God says, you're complaining about a bower, which I grew in one day. That's what you're complaining about. Consider how hurt I am by the way the Ninevites have acted in their violent ways. How much I want to save them. So, you know, he's asking Jonah to get some perspective here, right? But what's interesting is that in the Christian uh, art of the time, they use Jonah under the bower unironically. Right? Like they use it as a straight up image of a restful afterlife. They forget the rest of the story or they choose not to use it. So they are selectively choosing which parts of the story they're going to use to evince their idea of what the afterlife is like. So again, they're not being literal, they're not being loyal to the story. There, no one should admire Jonah, and yet they use Jonah because Jesus mentioned Jonah, so it must be okay to use the images from the Jonah story as a way of understanding the afterlife. So these early Christians were kind of complicated. They weren't doing things in a straightforward way at all, um, but, but they did it anyway. So um, I just want to catch up here. We've been going on. All right. Okay. So, so these images that we see are deeply meaningful. They're highly symbolic. They're not random. And what's interesting is this woman who had this particular room painted this way, all of this is significant. She's looking out as a dead person 
on the shepherd who will guide her to the afterlife, past the peacock, which guarantees eternal life, past the three men in the fire, knowing that she will be rescued from the dangers of death and towards the image of Jonah as a symbol of resurrection. It's, uh, and these, uh, these rooms can be found throughout the catacombs. Um, all of them invested in this kind of imagery, which suggests that um, they were using art to express their theological vision of how the afterlife and what life was about. And there's all sorts of images in these catacombs. Like, for instance, this is one of Jesus's baptism. Anybody notice something weird about this image? He's a child. Yeah, he's a child. Exactly. And this is pretty consistent. And scholars have debated, why is this? Like, you know, maybe this was just a baptism of a child. But it shows up so often in the catacombs that it couldn't be. It's got to be Jesus. But it suggests that for these Christians, their life begins at baptism. Right? They get a new lease on life through baptism. So they depict Jesus as a child being baptized because they were reborn when they were baptized. There's also multiple images of uh, the Magi. This is uh, what's really interesting about these catacombs is they were done so early. It's before the conventions of Christian art have kicked in. Right? They're still experimenting with how to um, present things. So in this image, which is, you know, pretty faded, but these things are like 2000 years old or 1800 years old. Mary's in the middle with Jesus on her lap on the right. And then how many Magi are approaching her? Four. Four. Yeah. Four. It's, it's two on each side, right? Um, because in, if you read Matthew's account of the Magi's arrival, he never says how many there are. Hmm. He never says how many there are. He just says that they brought three gifts. So over time, we got the idea that there must have been three magi, but that wasn't guaranteed. So in the catacombs, there's multiple images of different numbers of magi because that, that tradition hasn't crystallized yet. The very first image. Oh, and the other thing which is interesting is, and I'm sorry, I don't have an image uh, offhand to show you of this, but in uh in a lot of the roman um a lot of the roman triumph arches as well as some of their their own um tombs and stuff they will show images of what happens in the aftermath of a roman war and the romans would you know sack and pillage and conquer a city and they would take all the most valuable stuff with them home and there'd be these great parades into rome trailing prisoners of war and chains and then also carrying all the loot which they got from the town or people that they've managed to conquer mm -hmm. and the people who bring the loot to the emperor are usually depicted holding it out in their hands in front of them you know, sort of like here's the stuff that we got from the barbarians and so in these images of the magi from the very beginning they are shown with the gifts that they brought in the same position approaching Jesus. <laughs> so pagan imagery shows uh, offerings to the emperor of things which were stolen through violence. And these images show the Magi voluntarily bringing gifts to the one who will preach a lesson of nonviolence. So it's an example of appropriating the iconographic uh, appearance of violence and turning it on its head to make it into a peaceful symbol. This room, um, which is in also in the catacombs of Priscilla, has what is believed to be the earliest image of just three magi. And you can see it at the top of that arch. See the three uh, people going to right. Jesus in the middle there at the top. So here's a mm -hmm. version of it. So there they are, same same, uh, same pose with their hands out in front of them, bringing the gifts to Mary and Jesus, kind of faded. But is there anything unusual about the way they're depicted? 
Looks like they're naked. Yeah, no, sort of. I mean, they seem to be wearing skirts, maybe. Like the way they... Maybe toga, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're also different colors. <laughs> colors. Yeah, uh, colors. It's a little bit faded, but, you know, obviously the middle figure is a red color, right? Right. And the one to his right seems to be a sort of greeny color. Green, green. And the one on the far left is some sort of light color. And, you know, again, these images have <clears throat> over the years. But... Um, it's this isn't a racial uh, this isn't a racial reference. Uh, the Romans didn't really believe in race, uh, neither did the Christians. Like they didn't talk about people in terms of what they looked like in that sense. Um, you could conquer someone for their tribe or their religion, but nobody cared about your race. That's a modern invention. Um, so these colors, though, reflect a uh, sense of. Although we know that the Magi came from what is probably Saudi Arabia now, or maybe Iraq, um, back then they said, no, the Magi represent all the continents of the world who have peoples who have come to recognize that Christ is the true king. They knew of three continents back then, Africa, Asia, and Europe. And so they colored the Magi differently to represent those three continents. And the Magi, the Magi represent, sorry. There we go. Um, the Magi are, show up a lot in the catacombs. Whereas the shepherds and the star, uh, rather the shepherds and the angels in the sky don't show up, I don't think at all. Um, if they show up at all, it's very, very infrequently. The Magi show up all the time. And there's a reason for that. The Magi weren't Jews, right? They were from distant lands. And um, they represent the fact that Christianity is being offered to all peoples of the world, not just the Jews from which it's it sprang in Israel. So the Magi are, a, are an explicit statement by the Christian story that Gentiles from all over the world are welcome to um, belong to this faith. And that matters a lot because most of the people in these tombs were Roman pagans. They were Gentiles, right? They weren't Jews who had converted to Christianity. They were Roman pagans. And so it, may, it meant a lot to them to know that from the very beginning, this faith had been offered to everybody, not just the Israelites. And so they put it on their walls saying, yeah, I belong, see? I belong from the beginning to these people. Um, why don't I pause there for a second? Any questions before we go on? Jocelyn? Well, it's a question, but uh, who would be um, in charge of choosing the images that have been put on the wall in that we ha clearly have the, the lady from the first one, who might be a wealthy uh, resident, and that explains something. But all of these images show some sort of intellectual development. So it's not just being the everyday person who's uneducated. Mm. So, and also, would these image would they be built prior to the person's death, or like during their lifetime, or afterwards? Mm. You know, I'm not sure anybody knows. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, honestly. Um, I can tell you that the style of painting looks very similar to the sort of painting which they did in frescoes for pagan tombs as well as pagan homes. Like if you see the art at Pompeii, it looks the same in terms of the number of colors and the way they depict human figures and stuff like that. But in terms of whether they would do the paintings first and then start putting bodies in, I don't know. Okay. Anybody have some questions I can answer? <laughs> <laughs> you could be a student of this your entire life and not know everything. right? Okay, well, let's carry on. Um, so one of the interesting uh, practices they had back then was that uh, pagans as well as Christians and Jews would bury their dead in whatever manner they chose. And then 
every year after that, on the anniversary of the death, they would go to visit the dead. And they would have a dinner party around the dead. They would have a picnic in the catacombs, say, or they would have a picnic um, next to their dead in one of those little rooms which they built in one of the necropolises. And this was a normal thing. And we see it depicted on the catacomb walls. So this is an example of it. Um, so in the center, you see seven people uh, around a table. It's kind of hard to see, but there's fishes and bread in front of them that they're eating. And if you look on either side of the table, those are baskets. And uh, one of the baskets on the right-hand side is kind of faded. You see a little suggestion of it. But if you count the baskets, you'll get seven baskets. And yes. if, you count, if you count the people, you'll see seven people as well. And that's consistent in these pictures. Um, there's usually seven people and seven baskets. And the baskets are usually filled with bread. So does that remind anybody of anything? No. Oh. <laughs> Fishes and loaves, right? Right. Right. So when Jesus works the miracle of the fishes and loaves, uh, at the end, he tells the disciples to go gather up the leftovers. And in one story, they bring back 12 baskets of leftovers and another, they bring back seven. And so in these pictures, they show seven baskets um, uh, to invoke that story. But also the fact that there were any leftovers is an indication of God's abundance, God's abundant generosity that when Jesus does this, you know, impromptu, miraculous catering, there's more than enough for everyone, even though there's, in one case, 4,000 people plus women and children, and 5,000 in the other plus women and children. So, and there were, and the number seven is significant to pagans and Jews alike as a number of completeness, right? Seven days of creation, seven days of the week. Uh, they believe that there were seven planets, they didn't know about a couple of them. So they counted just mm -hmm. Mercury, Venus, uh, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune. And one more uh, missing one. But they believe that there were seven objects which moved. Well, actually, the sun and moon. Sorry, that was what they counted the sun and moon. So there were seven objects in the sky that moved around. Um, so seven was a number of completeness. So this isn't a documentary image of a of a typical dinner party, which people would have in the graves, but rather a suggestion of the bank, the heavenly banquet, which awaits all of us when we die and we are in Christ. So again, taking something real and then lifting it to a kind of theological level, because the people would have had dinner in these rooms and looked up at this picture of another dinner, but of a dinner which suggests um, uh, the banquet of heaven and, and Jesus in the gospels often refers to the kingdom of heaven as being like a wedding banquet, right? So here's another image. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven baskets in the foreground and seven people. Is that seven? Yeah, it's seven people eating. So it's pretty consistent. <laughs> and here's another image of the same kind of thing. Um, this one's not as consistent. This may have been, this is actually on top of a pagan tomb. So it's possible that these are more documentary, like realistic in a documentary way of refrigerants. Now, there's a fascinating, uh, there's a fascinating twist on this story. And among the catacombs I visited, one was called the Catacomb of San Sebastian. So St. Sebastian. And <clears throat> during, this, during the third century, in the 200s, there were several waves of persecution of Christians. Um, one happened, for instance, in the 250s. And during those waves, the Roman emperors would send out orders to um, uh, basically any Christians who refused to do the annual sacrifice to Fortuna um, should be should be put to trial, told that they have to do it. And if they refuse, then just kill them. And so there'd be these waves of martyrdom, which would occur. <clears throat> and 
during one of these uh, persecution periods, which lasted for a few years, they shut down the Christian catacomb. And they were really trying to be hard on the Christians. And during that period, in the catacomb of San Sebastian, they sealed off the catacombs so the Romans couldn't get in there and they weren't allowed to be burying anybody new anyway. But then they built a new room so that these dinner parties could happen. And these dinner parties are called refrigeriums, a place of refreshment, right? We have refrigerators for keeping the food fresh. They had refrigeriums for uh, refreshing themselves by eating um, a dinner with the dead. So they create this room in the catacomb of San Sebastian. And I wish I could show you a picture of the room, but they didn't allow us to take pictures in the catacombs. Um, but what's interesting is in the second, in the, in the 200s, Christians would come here to have their dinners for the dead and they scratch graffiti into the walls and that graffiti would survive. And that graffiti looks like this. So that's a typical wall in this room in San Sebastian. Now, I know we're not used to reading graffiti, much less Latin graffiti. So I'll help you out a bit. So there it is in close up. So you can see it's just scratched all over the place. So what the one in white reads is Paul, E.D., Petra, Petit, Pro Victoria. Okay, so Paul, right, as in the Apostle Paul, E.D. means um, and, Petra, Peter. Petit doesn't mean small, it means petition, okay, and pro victore, the governor, which would mean God. So Paul and Peter petition God for me. And this is scratched all over these walls, like all the walls in this room had these scratches from people over, over the course of half a century or so. Why would they do this? Well, the, the belief is that during these waves of persecution, Paul and Peter are obviously very, very important figures to the early Christians, right? You know, even then they know about Peter believed to be, you know, I mean, Jesus has said he would be the rock on which the church was founded. He's believed mm -hmm. to be the first bishop of Rome. Paul, who obviously was critical in um, converting the Gentiles to Christianity and later goes to Rome, writes his famous letter to the Romans on his way there and is martyred in Rome and buried outside of the Roman walls in a place that was next to um, uh, a circus and a, a horse racing track but that place eventually becomes the vatican right like where he was born and buried becomes saint peter's basilica and all around it becomes the vatican but during before that happens right none of that can happen during the time of persecution this is pre-constantine before that happens Scholars believe, based on this graffiti evidence, that the bodies of Paul and Peter were dug up and moved to San Sebastian's catacomb for safety's purposes. And so, and while their bodies were there, Christians would come to this room in the San Sebastian um, catacomb and scratch into the walls. Paul and Peter, since you're here, could you please intercede on behalf of my loved one so they get into heaven? So it's really cool being in this room because, you know, you read about Paul and Peter and it's like, oh, yeah, they're literary figures. Nope. They were here. You know, Kilroy was here. Paul and Peter were here. Like it scratched right into the wall. It's very, very cool. And... There's even a piece uh, written by Pope Demasis, who uh, had a lot to do with this, um, had a lot to do with this particular catacomb in the fourth century. And he actually wrote something uh, explicitly about this on one of the walls. And he said, here you should know the saints once dwelt, you who are seeking the names of both Peter and Paul. The Orient sent us the apostles, we admit it willingly, but through their martyrdom, Following Christ above in the celestial spheres and in the kingdom of the righteous, Rome was enabled to claim them as her citizens. 
This, O oh new star, is what Demesis wanted to say in your praise. And this is actually a critical thing, uh, which I had not appreciated before I got to Rome. If you go to Rome, Paul and Peter are everywhere. They're just everywhere. There's giant statues of them standing out St. Peter's Basilica. Um, there's entire churches devoted to them. Paul outside the walls is a major basilica. St. Peter obviously has the famous St. Peter's Basilica. Um, all the iconography uh, in, you know, Roman Catholic iconography portrays Paul and Peter all the time. And what Demasis is saying is really interesting. He's saying, even though these two guys came from the East, like the Middle East, they, they qualify as Romans because they were martyred here. It's a pretty sick and twisted way of <laughs> saying that someone is one of your citizens because we had the good taste to kill them. But at that time, they believed where your body was, was where you are. Right. Like they really put a lot of emphasis on the mm -hmm. sacredness of a body. Right. And this turns into the worship of relics later on. Um, so the fact that Peter and Paul's resting place, like eternal resting place, was in Rome was really, really important for giving the Roman Catholic Church uh, the legitimacy which it claimed for itself. You know, you could imagine another another way of seeing it saying, well, Christianity starts in Jerusalem, so Jerusalem should really be the seat of Christianity. But the Romans went, nope, Paul and Peter died here, therefore we have the claim to being the true um, the true church. It's fascinating. <laughs> One can only imagine different sort of, you know, timelines where it didn't work out that way. Now, of course, Paul and Peter are not the only dead Christians which people put value on. And one of the things which becomes very clear is that the catacombs become a, uh, a spot where people go to visit martyrs because the martyrs and the waves of the persecution in the 200s would be buried in the catacombs. And people believe that the martyrs had the power to help you get into heaven. So, they start making a point of saying that someone's a martyr and burying them in the catacombs. And then people want to be buried next to the martyrs because they believe that, hey, if I'm buried next to this martyr, maybe that'll help me get into heaven. And we can see this in the catacombs. So this is the, uh, this is the marble tombstone of um, Cornelius, who was a pope who was martyred. Um, and he's in the San Calisto uh, catacomb. These are three three men who were murdered. And you can see their names above their heads. And they are in the uh, crypt of St. Cecilia. This is um, from the San Calisto uh, catacomb, which was run by the church. And this is actually a crypt devoted to popes. Uh, which was started in the third century of the 200s. So it becomes a really big deal to be buried near martyrs. And here, here's an example, a uh, really interesting one of, once again, a couple of women. Uh, the woman in the foreground who's doing the orals, she's the woman who has died. The woman behind her, and you can kind of see her name scratched in behind her head, is Petronilia. And she is, by tradition, believed to have been Peter's daughter, but she was definitely martyred. And she is pointing down to a basket of um, scrolls of scripture. And um, Where did you take that? There's a kind of book floating cool. above her. Um, and she is pointing the way towards heaven. She's going to basically escort this woman who's doing the orange to heaven. And she has the qualifications to do that because she is a martyr. So there's another development, though, which happens. History happens to the catacombs. And um, what happens next in the catacombs is that, sorry, let me get rid of this. There we go. Um, what happens next in the catacombs is that 
Christianity becomes the official religion of uh, the Roman Empire in the fourth century, right? In the 300s. Constantine has his conversion experience in 313 um, and becomes a Christian on his deathbed. But while he's still alive, he uh, funds the first basilicas. And uh, by the early 400s, Christianity has become the religion of the realm. But in 410, the barbarians invade and sack Rome. And like they get right into the right, get right into the city and they sack it. And along the way, they have to go through the countryside before they can reach the city. And of course, the catacombs are in the countryside. And the barbarian practice of burial is that you bury people with valuable items, you know, a warrior sword, a maiden's favorite <laughs> cup or whatever. And so when they came to the catacombs, they assumed that behind all those marble slabs, there must have been treasure buried with the dead. So they ransack the catacombs. And they take those marble tombstones and they smash them to the ground because they're not worth anything. And they pull out the bodies and they're looking for swords and stuff. And they're disappointed because most of the catacombs were, you know, the homes of poor Christians and the Christians didn't bury stuff with them. So it was a big waste of time. But nonetheless, they did a lot of damage to the catacombs. Once the barbarians leave and the Christians and the Romans are starting to put life back together, the church says, you know what? We don't have to hide our bodies anymore from the Roman state since we are, you know, the official religion. <laughs> so why don't we start burying our people above ground? And uh, where do people want to be buried? Well, they want to be buried next to churches, because churches will now have the bodies of martyrs buried in, them, in some cases. So church cemeteries start growing and people aren't buried in the catacombs anymore. But the catacombs, because they had been home to the martyrs, become sites of pilgrimage. And so for the next few centuries, like until like the 800s or so, uh, people from all over Europe will make a special trip down to Rome to go, you know, visit the Eternal City, but also definitely make a side trip to the catacombs so that they can go down into the catacombs to visit some martyrs and pray before um, the, the uh, burial places of martyrs and popes. So this, uh, um, and then in the centuries that followed that, so by the eighth or ninth century, uh, it's becoming too hard to keep up the catacombs. They decide to just close them down. And the bones from the martyrs are transferred to churches all over Europe. And so there's no reason to go to the catacombs anymore. So they just fall into disuse. And that's why the catacombs look like this. The barbarian invasions had started the destruction of the catacombs. And then over the centuries, disuse uh, carried, continued that process. And then once the catacombs were abandoned by the church, no longer kept up by them, then grave robbers in the Middle Ages came through the catacombs as well. And um, they ransacked things. And, and sometimes they were trying to steal Christian stuff because they knew that Christian stuff sold well. So they would steal some of the marble slabs. And then the other thing is that the any marble slabs that were left in a lot of these places would be just taken and used for building as building materials for the farmers and stuff who lived in the countryside around the catacombs. So that's why the catacombs look like this. They've been subject to the hollowing out by Visigoths and um, Visigoths and grave robbers and just general disuse. So that's why they, they look empty. There's still some bodies in there. And there's like 60 catacombs around Rome and tourists are only allowed to visit like between four and six of them, depending on which ones are open. So there are still intact catacombs, but not like intact tombs, but not very many. And the funny thing, so this is what, um, this is the San Calixtus uh, um, catacomb, the way it looks now, it's being fixed up nicely. It's still in the countryside. It's on, along one of those old Roman roads, very pretty to visit. Um, and these catacombs fell into disuse, uh, during the middle ages. And then in the 1600s, they were rediscovered 
um, by a guy called Bossio. And Bossio started exploring the tunnels and started making maps of them and stuff. But the funny thing was that, you know, they're, as I said before, they're vast, right? Easy to get lost in these things. So Bossio's answer to that, so that he wouldn't get lost, was to write his name on the walls. And you can see his name. Oh, God. Yeah, the names of his friends on the walls so they wouldn't get lost next to these beautiful paintings, these beautiful priceless paintings on the walls. He would just write his name into it. So, okay, I've been here before. I must be, I'm, I guess I turned left here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just like, what? Seriously? Um, and it wasn't until the 19th century that someone scientific started to actually uh, look at these things and um, properly catalog them and make proper maps of them. And that work continues now. And they don't write on the walls anymore to keep their bearings. Um, although there are signs and stuff, because you can get lost in here really, really easily. So that, in a nutshell, is uh, the story of the catacombs. I could go on for another hour, but I won't. Um, and you get the basic idea. That's, that's what catacombs are like. So um, any questions? Uh, things I left out that you'd like to know about? Stephen, how did they balance the the tourist um, uh, access to the catacombs with the sacred nature of the, of the catacombs? Have they found a balance for that? Yeah, there's actually some, some of those uh, rooms, you know, the private uh, wealthy people rooms that have the arcosoliums and stuff, you can actually do masses in, the, in there. Okay. Some of the rooms you can book them and you can go down and do a, a mass in there. Um, otherwise, uh, nobody gets to go into the catacombs without a guide. So you have to book, you have to book your time in advance. Um, and if you're going to go, make sure you go online and, you know, just check out what the rules of, of are yeah. of the particular thing. Uh, they take small groups and, um, really the way they protect the catacombs is by not letting the tourists see very many of them. There's 60 of them. You can visit maybe six. The hours are fairly short. Um, so they, you know, they don't want tourists, you know, crashing catacombs. So it's better to give them tours. And what's really right. cool is I asked like that room that, um, that woman was in, you know, the, the woman <laughs> stage of her life. I asked the guide, how is it the colors are so bright? You know, I mean, it's like almost 2000 years old. How is it the colors are so bright? And she said, oh, what they do is they have lasers now that they just set up lasers in the middle of the room and they leave it for like days at a time. And the layers, lasers slowly burn off all the stuff, which has accrued over the years um, so that it can look so bright. So wow. yeah, so Amazing. We're, probably, we're probably seeing them better than a lot of the people saw them, you know, like when they were actually in use. Probably true. So that was my other question was, it looks to me like they've been cleaned and conserved, but not, restored like those haven't been painted over those have just been cleaned yeah i don't think yeah. so. i don't think they've been restored um in my next talk when i talk about the sarcophagi those mm -hmm. things occasionally like the the labels next to them will say this part and this part was restored in the 19th century you know um but no i think like a lot of the paintings in the catacombs are in pretty bad shape like you really have to i i tried to show you ones which are pretty obvious what they are but there's lots where you go what was there you know because yeah. they faded a lot um sure. or maybe they haven't had the laser treatment yet and also like because they they're frescoes right so they paint them into the walls while the plaster is wet yeah. uh which means that if anything happens to the wall the plaster comes off so does the painting right so there's all sorts of them where like half of it's missing and you know, which is unfortunate, but that's just, you know, right. history at work. Yeah. History at work. Yeah. yeah. So my next installment on this will happen in early November, and it'll be about the sarcophagi, because that's <laughs> the next major stage of Christian art. And it starts in the early 300s, um, when Christianity gets legalized, and also when enough Christians are wealthy enough to be able to afford sar sarcophagi. And a sarcophagus, right, is a, a stone yes. coffin, right? And they carve into the coffin. They're usually made of marble. They carve into it. And what I'll do is I'll show you what pagan sarcophagi look like 
and then show you what Christian sarcophagi look like. And the contrast is remarkable. And it shows this huge sensibility shift about what life is and what death is compared to what the Romans thought. And it's a really, really effective way of sort of getting up. Oh, that's how things changed, you know. Um, I, and and it's also beautiful. And Christ shows up a lot in the sarcophagi you know, that he doesn't in the catacombs. Did you meet anyone else uh, that was looking at catacomb art the way you were? No. <laughs> I mean, the, the guides got it. Like, the guides thought my questions are really interesting because they think that way too. But um, uh, tourists are tourists, right? They're just there to see the pretty pictures, and someone told them to go see the catacomb art. Uh, I did meet some priests who were there. Um, there was one Roman Catholic priest from Jersey who had come over with somebody to take a look. but And we did have an interesting discussion with him and the guide, who was a nun. Um, but uh, otherwise, no, it was just, you know, general tourists. Um, yeah, like the thing about the catacombs is you have to know the Bible stories pretty well, and then you have to be able to take a second look and go, hmm, maybe it's Jonah coming <laughs> sea monster you know like it's not obvious <laughs> at all <laughs> so to just see them it's like creepy and cool but you may not know what you're looking at Stephen right. sorry yeah. Stephen out of curiosity when you went down some of those into the catacombs what did anybody have claustrophobia no 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 I mean, maybe there was some self-selection going on there yeah but I definitely would the first ones you showed that were so narrow yeah and that's not an exaggeration you really feel like they're yeah 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 it's nice and cool and they were done there because the because the uh, the ground they could dig in and everything there yeah the type of the, ty the type of clay or soil or whatever yeah i i don't know if there's <clears throat> rock in other parts of rome but it was certainly very convenient that the rock was soft made the digging <laughs> way easier and it was nice. I mean, it was rich people giving their land so that poor people could have a place to sleep at night. Uh, Jocelyn? Who uh, owns or is in charge of administration of these catacombs now? Is it the state or is it the Catholic Church? Yeah. or where, Who who do you pay your ticket fee to? Um, I, I, the Catholic Church is in charge. Like the Vatican, I think, is in charge of all these things. Um, yeah, I, I, certainly churches, but I think it's ultimately the Vatican because the Vatican sees them as an archaeological treasure. Um, and so they don't want them messed with by individual churches, you know, just having them fall into disuse. That's that's my understanding anyway. And, and scholars continue to study them. I mean, they're just a treasure trove of information about early Christianity. Hmm. Okay. Fascinating. Well, thank you, really interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> and thank you for, you know, uh, the church did fund my sabbatical. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Before before you go, Stephen, I loved your your way of speaking about uh, Jonah. Your your account was marvelous. Uh, it was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from all the historical, that really I thought you 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 spoke so well. That made it alive. Wonderful. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. Barfed up on the shore. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, in the Hebrew, the word is like vomit. Like it doesn't say. And then he was cast on the shore. It means. Bleh. You know? <laughs> Anyway, well, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you. I did record this session, so I'll trim it a bit and I'll put it up on the web uh, next week. Emily heard it. Thank you very much. It's really thank been a bye bye. Thank you, bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Stephen.